Our next session for this morning is entitled Mekong Perspectives on Climate Change. I would like to invite Dr. John Doerr, Lead Advisor for the Mekong Australia Partnership Water, Energy and Climate, to introduce our panel. Okay, thank you and good morning everybody. Um, as just announced, you know that this session is more than just perspectives, it's perspectives of Mekong citizens on building resilience to climate change. So, um, joining me here this morning, uh, we have uh, Un. Uh, Mr. Un Huen is a young man from Lao PDR with a master's degree in international development studies, focusing on, oh. Clearly Un has some support in the crowd. <laughs> um, uh, Un's master's focused on livelihood adaptation, rural development and resettlement in Lao. Un used to work as a coordinator for the INGO network to promote and strengthen collaboration between and among CSOs and different parts of the Lao government. For some years now, I'm very happy to say, he's been a highly respected member of the team at the Australian Embassy in Vientiane. So welcome Un. No need to clap again. <laughs> okay, um, also joining me this morning is Dr. Sutat. Dr. Sutat is the former director of Thailand's what a wonderfully polite audience. <laughs> Dr. Sutat, um, uh, as I said, former director of the Hydro Informatics Institute under the Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research and Innovation, and a member of the ASEAN Hydro Informatics uh, Data Center. Now, Dr. Sutat is a very highly respected professional uh, who throughout his career of relevance to this session has been contributing greatly to building understanding and cooperation within Thailand, but also within the Mekong region and with other ASEAN member countries. So welcome, Dr. Sutat. Professor Xu Jun Xu. Uh, Jun Xu. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jun Xu is another very accomplished scientist based in Kunming, who is also very practical and has done a great job in contributing to regional and international cooperation. Jan Shu is an ethnobotanist working on land systems across the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. He has a very strong background in interdisciplinary research on landscape restoration, agroforestry systems, and circular agriculture. Glad you can join us, Jan Shu. And finally, um, Sochita Sim from Cambodia. Sochita is also a very accomplished and determined Cambodian civil society leader and an alumni of universities of uh, Phnom Penh, Geneva and Melbourne. Sochita manages the Oxfam Mekong Regional Water Governance Program. She's interested in, these are my notes, not hers. Um, I perceive her to be interested in all of the dimensions of the IPCC, but I expect she takes particular interest in climate change impacts on public health, gender equality, social inclusion, and risks to vulnerable communities. So welcome, Sachita. It's noted that Sachita got two rounds of applause and you gentlemen only one. <laughs> All right, really, it, it, it's my pleasure to sort of be, uh, have these guests with us today. So let's get going. So, Un, you've listened to scientists this morning. What are your perspectives on building resilience to climate change? What are you seeing? What are you thinking? Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for the kind introduction. And actually, thank you very much to SCI for the invitation to speak today. Uh, for this special uh, particular session, I will be speaking as one of the Mekong citizen. I'm not rep representing my uh, employer or uh, any government. <clears throat> so um, I'd like to start from the Mekong commitment at COP, at recent COP meeting. It was highlighted this morning by the um, delegation from Thailand that the, the Mekong government have made high political commitment at the COP meeting and same for other countries in the region. So with that, um, I like also to start with that um, this Mekong region collectively is not the biggest emitter of CO2, but 
Yet, because we are in the same planet with, with other regions, we are also vulnerable to climate change. Um, I'd like to remind the audience that in just last five years, this region faced significant climate hazards. For example, in 2018, the region was um, experiencing uh, extremely flooding. But a year after that, in 2019 and 2020, this same region faced severe drought. You know, the Mekong was at, his, at its lowest in five decades. And just um, earlier this year, this same region, John, uh, faced a uh, heat wave and very bad um, air pollution. So I like to just remind people, and this tree even alone caused massive economic impact to this region. With that in mind, the government in this region, um, particularly under the framework of Mekong River Commission, they met recently in Vientiane in April this year. They have acknowledged that this is a threat coming to this region, a threat to economy, a threat to food security, biodiversity, and livelihoods of many millions. It was also highlighted this morning by many speakers. <clears throat> so the interesting part is how Mekong countries uh, will, will aim or will uh, implement the actions to achieve the ambitious target to achieve net zero emission that they have made at COP meeting. And this varied because different countries has different potential, different development priorities, right? Um, leave it with that. I'd like to move one layer down to Mekong River Commission. Um, the MRC Secretariat you know, has been uh, tasked by its leaders, leaders of Mekong countries, to implement to actually accelerate climate actions, um, to look into risks and opportunity facing this region. And we heard from Mr. Sofelin yesterday that the Secretariat is actually implementing a number of climate actions. For example, um, it's trying to strengthen its um, flood and drought forecasting capability so that it can better serve the member countries. The joint study with upper, upper riparian countries to study um, the changing patterns of hydrological conditions and adaptation strategies, the proactive regional planning to look into uh, different options of water energy integration. So that's MRC. Now I'd like to spend a few more minutes um, to speak about Laos, which is the country where I'm from. The government is well aware of the climate change and the impact. And in fact, the country has been hit by several hard shots recently. Just earlier, just last month, the central part of Laos was flooded and experiencing and experienced a severe landslide, causing massive impact. With that, the, gov the government has put in place several um, strategies, climate sensitive strategies and policy. I, li I like to um, Remind a few, the National Social Economic Development Plan, the Green Growth Strategies, the National Climate Change uh, Strategies. All these key strategies highlight the importance of building resilience, focusing on green infrastructure, and uh, reducing disaster re reduction. So um, with assistance from different stakeholders, and many of you are in this room, the government have, has taken action to implement on a, a lot of mitigation and adaptation uh, activities in different sectors, in forestry sector, agriculture, in water sector. It was also highlighted by a representative from La Women Union yesterday that they are also implementing a lot of activities, particularly in watch sector. Now, I think um, Laos is in the in interesting transition period. The image you see behind me shows that 
we are moving, we are taking um, climate actions quite seriously in partnership with different stakeholders, particularly private sector. And I'd like to highlight two sectors here. In energy sector, you may have heard that just last month, Laos has started constructing the first wind power project and the largest one in Southeast Asia with over with, uh, 600 megawatt. And there is a series of talk to expand that project recently. So I think for me, that kind of um, actions is related to the presentation made by one of the professors this morning. It's one of the climate medication. It is um, climate friendly infrastructure, right? Um, the country, Laos, is also looking at the other energy options, working with different stakeholders, including Australia, to look at palm hydropower storage, to look at solar, also hydrogen. So I think Laos recognized the, the climate change to its hydropower sector, which is the uh, main source of energy for now and start to look for options, which is um, quite a good move from my perspective. Now, on transportation sector, the image you see is Lao China Railway. Um, it has started operation for almost two years now. And the st statistic I see in terms of transportation of passengers and goods and cargo is massive. Speaking about passengers alone, the, the infrastructure has transported more than 14 million passengers in nearly two years. So that's... Including Jan Chu. Yes. <laughs> that's very massive. Imagine if you were to transport that big number of passengers by the conventional mode of transportation, by bus, individual cars, flights, that's going to burn massive, massive amount of fuel, fossil fuels, right? So I think Laos is, is in an interesting period, um, you know, with major infrastructure being developed uh, to, to uh, address climate action, climate uh, crisis. The government is also promoting um, the EV with the aim to reach about 30% by 2030. And if you go to uh, major cities in Laos now, you start to see um, a lot of EV cars on the road. So that's quite good, but the infrastructure, the charging station um, is still limited. If it gets expanded, I think more people will start to use EVs given that the petrol price in Laos is really high at the moment. Just this morning, it get increased again. So that's a lot of information there. I'd like to end by saying that the Mekong countries acknowledge that the climate change is real. It's actually happening now, not in the far future, and therefore start to take action quite seriously. You know, we, we thank, you know, partners from far and near, near and far, to support our region. Because we alone cannot address these global issues, right? So with that, I'd like to um, echo uh, the discussion we had yesterday and also presentation by the scientists this morning that we need cooperation. We need funding. We need you know, scientists like many of you here, we need new knowledge to help us achieve the climate targets. The other thing um, which is very important is that given that majority of the population in this region rely a lot on water and land for their livelihoods and incomes, we need to pay more attention to those people we need more investment in them. We need to include them more to, to be able to uh, achieve equitable 
sustainable development. Thank you, John. Thank you, Won. Yeah. Won received his invitation to speak about two days ago, I think. <laughs> Um, but yeah, points really well made, Un, and uh, thank you for that, both the showing what's happening in Laos and also reminding where you know there's significant attention required. While I've got you, so uh, ASEAN Chairmanship next year uh, is climate, how do you expect climate resilience will feature or not on the agenda of, uh, of Laos as it sort of sets the agenda with the ASEAN member countries? So just last two weeks, uh, our Lao Prime Minister attend ASEAN summits in Indonesia and uh, assume chairmanship for next year, 2024. Um, at this stage, we don't have much information in terms of the kinds of priorities that the government as a chair of ASEAN will drive. But from the speech of the Prime Minister, um, he wants to um, continue the good legacy by Indonesia, which is to build a better and resilient ASEAN. So I think that's a good start, right, for many of us here working in water energy um, issues and environment issues, to have the resilient in the themes. Um, but I know that many of the stakeholders here are ready and working with some of your Lao government counterparts, including Australia, we, um, also preparing up, um, itself to support the government of Laos. I think um, it will be very well received by the government. And in fact, uh, just in next month, uh, Australia, together with Vietnam and ASEAN, will host uh, the high-level dialogue on energy and climate in Hanoi. So that's one of the activities uh, in the lead up to uh, to the ASEAN, ASEAN Chair Year of, ASEAN, of, of Laos. Okay, thanks, Un. So just a reminder of this um, connectivity of the region that Un emphasized at the beginning. Um, for those that are familiar with the Monsoon Project, you know, Lao Project exporting to Vietnam, um, where do the blades come from? Probably uh, from China, not sure. Um, finance from Thailand and Japan. Legal services from Singapore. You know, it's a really multi-country sort of effort and something that uh, Lao is um, leading. And uh, we hope it's a very successful sort of uh, initiative. Thanks, Un. Um, Dr. Sutat, and I, 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 before I go to Dr. Sutat, I just let you know that everyone here is very different very different uh, perspectives, and we're not gonna cover all of the Mekong region and every possible perspective. <laughs> My friends have just been invited to sort of put a few remarks out there, but everybody in the room has their perspective. Dr. Sutat, what are yours, sir? What would you like to share with us? Thank you, John. So I would like to share the hydroinformatics perspective on the recorded data and the future prediction. For the precipitation and the index, uh, Thailand has uh, four tributaries uh, in the Mekong region as shown in the figures. The data of precipitation for 40 years show anomaly in the high value show in the green colors and uh, the less than the anomaly show in the orange colors. Uh, this is the first two uh, sub tributaries. Uh, we can draw the discussion that the peak value has increased as you show, see in the green colors, starting from year 2000, it start uh, to grow uh, around 10% increasing in North Kong and Northern Kong. 
And the second finding is the dry spell, the characteristic of dry spell, which is consecutive three to four years, still exists uh, before 2000 and after year 2000. Uh, in Thailand, uh, people afraid of droughts uh, compiling to flood because uh, in the local communities. The last two big subtributary in Chi and Moon contribute the same for the increasing annual rainfall by 20 and even higher for 30 percent. And the dry spell is still persistent before year 2000 and after year 2000. This is the data from hydroinformatics to provide the direction of development and adaptation in Mekong. For the future climates, uh, we use uh, 19 CMIPS 5 and with the bias correction uh, methodologies and uh, two R RCPs and the time scale is from near future, medium future, and far future as the standard one. I will, I will present only four selected indicators. The first one is the drought, which is consecutive dry days. Every, in the, in the annual basis, there are around two months, 65 days. And as you can see, that increment will be up to 40% increasing all perspective. So it means that from two months, it will increase to three months. For the, for the consecutive wet days, it keep increasing, or see, this is the good news, but with the less magnitude. So uh, 27 days, it will increase around 30% of this. This is good news. And the last two indicators show that maximum rainfall are X five day will be reduced. This is good because the extreme event may will reduce and the annual precipitation will reduce also. They have both opportunities and adverse impact on the available water physically according to the IPCCs. And the data shows to support Mr. Un that in 2018, you have more positive anomaly and suddenly next year you have negative anomalies. This is the uh, results of the hydroinformatics for present and future. So I shouldn't ask whether you were surprised. I mean, the science and the data is what the science and the data is. But how are you planning, as a person who's been working in hydroinformatics across the Mekong for your career, how do you sort of put this um, anticipation of change into sort of action going forward? Yes. Uh, thank you, John. We, this information will be uh, delivered to the uh, local people in the community level. So we, they will use uh, to have the direction of development first, and the second, how to uh, cope with this change, because we don't know really when it will occur. So we use a science and technology with the web and application. In Thailand, we use Thai water which gives you hourly data for 3,000 telemetering stations and the daily data of the dams. And community will use this information not only for the science technology in the blue one, but people should be trained to know themselves, the capacity and capability and even inspire themselves using the red one, which is sufficiently economy philosophy. So if two components can merge together, then the SDG will, will be achieved. We experienced this for 10 years. We proved of the concept. 
uh, a lot of community. They need to do assignment like a student in the universities to show participations. They have different techniques to work with them. I have two examples in the uh, Mekong tributaries. One is in Konkan, in the uh, Wang Noi province. Rainfall is only less than the average, only 900 millimeters. The area that we choose is suffer from drought and flood for long times. So we work with them and the ownership of the data and solution is with the community. This is to manage the water for 21 meter head difference. You can see in the block is the 223 on the right side and 202 on the left side. And you can see a lot of storage because people know that dry well is four years. So they need to have storage for four years. They, they know before we tell them, but we can tell them that that is, it will increase more. It will be pronounced by 30%. So on the right side, you can see outcome is not only the water, but it is the SDG for food security expansion to seven sub district And they can do expand by themselves because everyone would like to show their success in their areas. The last example is the uh, Ba Lim Thongs in Thailand. Ba Lim Thong is in Buli Lam. We call it, you need to punch water to drink because it's very difficult to, to get the water. In Thailand, we call Buli Lam Tam Nam Kin. <laughs> so we work with them uh, and because of topography, you can see that we have the small storage collected from the road. So it is multifunction of the road and collect the water in the storage. There are more than 100 storage, different sizing and everything managed by gravity by the people. So this is the example of uh, uh, equation that we use in the uh, Sufficiency economy philosophy plus science technology equal to the SDG. We got around eight SDG achievement, around half of them. So this is the proof already. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sutat. So for me, I've never seen that framework that you showed before. Can you just flick back to that quickly? Back one. So. Sufficiency, economy, philosophy, science and technology, SDGs. I mean, to me, that's you know new thinking for me this morning. But in terms of then the next examples, so does that give you some optimism? I think it was Tarek asked a question this morning as to, who you know, it can all be bad news if, if you only listen for bad news. But you're seeing some positive, uh, proactive climate adaptation. Is that so? And are the hydroinformatics um, scientists um, connecting well with the <laughs> community groups? How are you seeing it? Yes, yes. Uh, hydroinformatics will be on the blue one, the science technology. But in our institute, we have uh, mixed different kind of people. We can communicate with the local uh, community. We can communicate with them, not in the government uh, world, but in the, uh, the local world. So they, they understand. So you are right, we need to inspire them and showing their successful case. I think it is one of the key, as the, uh, the professor said, that the case study and you need to change the people also. In, and this is one of the important uh, variables in the solving of the climate change. Thanks, Dr. Sutat. We probably should move on, but uh, welcome your appreciation. But again, following the uh, the previous panel, and I think when we were starting to sort of organise this meeting, you know, we were really looking for the different scientists of the region who'd been in the IPCC. So um, your point's well taken that I think moving forward, there's a lot of other 
case material, whether it's hard science or quantitative or whatever else, but there is a lot of experience um, and uh, hopefully HII and others can be um, contributing to that going forward. But thank you. So um, we'll keep rolling and uh, Junshu, please. Um, you're leading the uh, Mountain Institute initiative based in Kunming. You are also an author in the recent uh, Hindu Kush Himalaya assessment coordinated by ISIMOD in Kathmandu, for those that know it. We're quite interested in your perspectives and what is happening in the Mekong region mountains and how can Mekong societies adapt? What are you thinking? What would you like to share with us? Okay, uh, before I comment, and can I have a video? Get ready for some high tech. <laughs> minutes. Human civilization started with agriculture. Without agriculture, today we cannot have a big population, big urbanization. We are expand agriculture at the cost of our nature, our forest, our water, our land, our grassland, our wetland. In the future, how are we going to solve the challenge of our population growth, human food and nutrition, and also protect nature? See, agriculture is the key for our human future. Now, look at the, the division rural and urban. So it's a digital division between rural and urban. Urban people will have mobile phones, enjoy the modern life. That's why urban attract a lot of people, because of the money, job, new technology. How we stimulate economic growth with a sustainable way, we have to look at the rural side, so our agriculture. The so brick is a typical example. We have a huge rural area rural population and a lot of people are still living in poverty. So digitalization or digital agriculture will change the scenario. We're going to have a low carbon and contribute less to greenhouse gas emission. We have more protect, manage the conflicts between wildlife and the human and the agriculture. Now we're going to protect more forests by manage the agricultural land forest land better and we're going to have more intensive farming, bring more agricultural efficiency, use less land, produce more food. Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, I just like to say, in addition to climate change, we have another challenge, so the division between rural and urban. How are we going to bridge the gap between the knowledge and also the economic growth between rural and urban? So, uh, I like to bring different angle. Uh, what's the opportunity to bring with through the digital technology? So everyone know the agriculture together as a rural land use contribute 25 a quarter to greenhouse gas emission at the total level. And uh, but look at the our Asia region. There's a diversity of farming system. So farming. I started with this learning shifting cultivation, the smallholder to manage the upland in the rural area of the Mekong region, particularly upstream. And also, now also we have uh, uh, rice terraces and also, and uh, now a lot of area designated as uh, uh, the global important agricultural heritage site, the protection area and uh, the traditional farming system. Then we manage, actually farmer manage a very diverse landscape, home garden, orchard, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and also the agriculture system with really to bring nature into agriculture land. Then our modern agriculture was uh, machinery, heavy, and the energy driven, and the, uh, the fuel and the coal. So that's contribute to large share of or lion share of greenhouse gas emission. Then what's the future rural agricultural landscape like, looks like? So digitalization is the opportunity 
to bring everything and uh, to uh, so I'd like to comment you and uh, through the four questions. First, do we have a clear signal of climate change? Do we heard from Laos and from Thailand? Uh, the answer is clear, yes, but the different areas have different signal. So my mountain future based in Hongho, upstream of Red River, is a, is a very famous honey rice terraces area. In past 30 years, and uh, my team did just uh, did the recent work. The so temperature increased 2.9 centigrade, much above the global uh, average. And uh, the rainfall reduced, and uh, your area, summer area, increased 30 percent. We reduced 296 millimeter in past 30 years. So we we'll get less water. But this year, my mountain future side, suddenly we get a flash flood. And within three hours, I get a, almost 300 millimeter rainfall, very intense rainfall. But the main project site is a tropical savanna type. And the annual rainfall only about 700 millimeter. So one event bring half a year of rainfall. So that's the extreme we're facing. So how are we going to deal with too much and the too little water in one location. That's the challenge. And the, my second question is, how can we find out the signal of climate change or coping with climate risk? So I like to say it's action we need today, we need to take it now, and then we need to bring nature into our heart. How? Today's mobile phone technology uh, artificial intelligence, internet. So before I come to Thailand, I can lo really look at the weather type or next day rainfall through the internet. So that's today's world. We're all connected. How really bring nature into your heart, in your mind, in daily action to understand what's upstream farmer, what they're doing and what's... So that's digital technology. It's about that's artificial technology about. So I, we create a word, a third nature. The nature, the third nature is full, totally from the first nature. The first nature, human are part of ecosystem. Human are bounded by na nature ecosystem. Farmer travel only 10 kilometer within watershed. Now today's nature is different. We work on second nature, and we totally forgot nature. We don't know how much temperature outside the building because we're living in the isolated nature with air condition. And the future nature, it's really you need to think about, and any moment, any decision, any knowledge, you need to bring nature in your mind, in your heart, in your uh, daily and uh, action. So that's a lot of comments how your fear interacts with nature. Just one question. Um, I'm struggling with, uh, I can see and witness and imagine people that have nature in their heart, you know? But that's not what I connect to when I see digitalization and AI and, uh, you know, the start of your movie, <laughs> which is, it's um, exciting, but I don't see the heart part. So I'm coming to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I think now and uh, back to agriculture, since we contribute 25 percent of a greenhouse gas emission, can we have carbon neutral agriculture? So that's the big challenge. And uh, now we produce not only uh, they, uh, produce food for fiber, but also rubber and uh, the other industry crop. And uh, so the question is really how carbon neutral world come along with agriculture or rural landscape? First, we need a smart seeds. The smart seeds, the seeds today, we need a different, we need to copy with drought, we need uh, to have warmer, hot, environment and the seeds can survive and can generate and can produce. And uh, again, that's 
say today's new breeding technology with artificial intelligence. And again, the second, we need a smart product. Now we produce cotton. My demonstration produce not traditional cotton in new cloth. We produce kapok tree. The, co uh, the, the fiber from kapok tree with a pioneer and glowing with a carbon sink. So, and uh, without water, and can survive, can harvest. We have a jawad kapok, uh, very nicely uh, planted in Aurelia. So, smart products are very important, a cotton example. The third one, the smart system. Say, for instance, agroforestry, the circular agriculture, when we get uh, nothing waste, nothing in the slow the circular, and we get uh, close to carbon neutral and the system, that's very important. Finally, I'd like to say we need a smart value chain. The smart farmer, if we don't have a smart consumer, and uh, it's, you cannot have carbon neutral world. So we need a smart value chain which links smart farmer with a smart consumer, with uh, everyone think about the nature. So that's, i like to say, that's a potential for agricultural sector. Finally, I'd like to say, can we have a better or quality life with a hotter climate? The answer, I say, is yes. Because, you know, how are we going to achieve that? We need a better relation. So we need to change the way of engagement. Engagement with nature, with the people, particularly our young generation, because we need to understand how young generation think. What do they want? What do they eat? So, so engage public young generation, another way of changing the relationship. And the third, we need also uh, what's called uh, engage, we need a new relationship with the new technology, make sure our producer or the consumer was equipped new technology like a smartphone and the same IT technology. Uh, finally, we need to think about the future and again, can we have a zero distinction of wildlife? Allow the elephant travel from Sisambana of Southern Yunnan to Kuiming to attend our COP meeting to develop the global uh, biodiversity framework. So thanks. Yeah, that's my uh, comments. Thank you, Jan Shu. I'm still imagining the elephant on the way to the COP. Uh, <laughs> Okay, Jan Chu is one of the uh, more active people I've met in my life, um, and I know partly what you've been doing for the last 30 years. I think he's just mapped out an agenda for um, agriculture, which will keep him busy for the next 30. So um, uh, a lot of interesting points in there, the different signals that, that Lao and Thailand and you know your, um, your big research site in the, the Hong He. It's just a good reminder of the, the, the way the impacts are so um, geographically specific, if you like. I sit here and when people talk about, we only have 900 millimeters of rainfall, you know? I mean, where I, where I live, um, we're very happy if we get 500 a year, you know, <laughs> really happy. So it's very relative. Um, and I also listen to Jun Shu then talk about, can we live with heat, extra heat? I don't know, I hope so, but Jan Bin is talking this afternoon um, in the urban resilience sort of session, and we do know that we can make our cities, um, we can design our cities better, and we can have more shade, and we can have more water sensitivity and a lot of you know, actions that way. So are you optimistic? And then we'll, a quick, a quick answer to that, and then we go to Sachita. Are you optimistic? Of course. And now, by the way, I'm designing my uh, vernacular architecture building and uh, can cope with the heat wave. You know? So I can live uh, comfortably without aircon and in very hot climate. I'm coming to visit. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jan Chu. So, Cheetah, kept you waiting. Wondering um, what you're sort of thinking about, what you've been hearing from the, uh, the colleagues that have preceded you. But if you don't want to comment on that, that's also fine. What are the sorts of points that you would like to sort of share with the room? Please. Thank you, John, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, 
I have uh, observed that the discussion today is very fascinating. Uh, moving from this morning uh, panel where we see a lot of facts, uh, at first it scares us. Um, but then I think the panel this morning uh, leave us with possible solution that we can do together. I am not a scientific in any way. Uh, John kindly introduced me earlier. I'm coming from a very ground experience. And I hear from Un and uh, Professor uh, Dr. Sutat and uh, our colleagues the, the stories, the facts that have shared resonate, resonate to what happened um, in Cambodia uh, with the community that uh, we work with. But I think the important point um, that I just want to make really short is that um, every degree of climate that increase, increase the risk for the community, for the people. And it's not that we need to slow down. It, we need to put our feet on the brake so that we have a chance to build the resilient capacity of the community. I think that the risk that present to us come much faster than the capacity of the people to adapt. So I, I think that we have a very big task from where we are, from what we are doing. We have a very big task on how we chip in our contribution to build that resilient capacity. That is a very big task. And we have heard uh, various examples of how that has been done. And I think it's really important to um, work in collaboration with different stakeholders because uh, at the end of the day, we have one common uh, voice, one common goal. Uh, we don't want to live in a warmer climate. I think we have to adapt to live in a warmer climate, definitely for myself. Uh, but how we can uh, pull the efforts together, that would be the key. Yeah. So Cheetah, um, you have a regional role, but you know, first you're a citizen of Cambodia. What else, what are you seeing in terms of adaptation that gives you uh, some cause for optimism? Um, where are the places you've been in the last little while that, that left you feeling a little bit inspired? The place I have been for a little while, I have you with me <laughs> for a little while. Uh, but uh, just to put the joke aside, I think that, um, yeah, maybe just to draw your attention to the picture that you see uh, on, the, uh, on the slide. Um, for Cambodia, um, our economy link very closely to the uh, river systems. Uh, we have the Mekong, we have uh, the, the Great Lake. Uh, this interconnection of the river system are very key for uh, first and foremost is the freshwater fishery productivity that contribute to our GDP. Uh, we rely uh, on agriculture sector and uh, based on the um, uh, estimation from the government, every degree of climate that increase have impact uh, to about 10% of rice production. So we are feeling this impact uh, very strongly. I think Cambodia uh, as a country in the Mekong um, experience both too much water at times and also very little water. The prolonged drought that we experience have hugely impact to agriculture sector to, to uh, water security and also the ability of the people to adapt. Um, we have a very fast growing urban area, which means that uh, demand for energy is increased. I will not talk uh, more on this book because we have a session in the afternoon that look into the energy, but just to recognize that in the urban area, both uh, fast growing uh, energy consumption, but we have the vulnerability when extreme rainfall happens. As you see in the third picture, uh, the city significantly slowed down um, uh, as I was preparing for this, I was going through an article and uh, one lady who has been residing in Phnom Penh as a seamstress described to, to, to the reporter how each time uh, the city flood, it impacts on her ability to do the work that she's doing. So 
different population with different um, income have felt with the impact. So the task in front of us is how we, what we do to help reduce those impact and make the community, make the people have the ability and more resilient. If, if the river is now having a water flow that is not regular as before, it makes the farmer unable to grow their river bank garden as before. So what do we do to support? Because their, their livelihood will re depend on river bank gardens. Their livelihood will depend on the fish catch. Now the fish has declined because water is really, is really low. The Tunle Sap Lake in Cambodia have suffered both from uh, uh, variable flows of the river, but also the extreme uh, climate, and it make the uh, fish die in massive uh, number because the temperature of the water rising, it make the uh, uh, flooded forest uh, fire, and this uh, destroy the spawning ground for the fish. So, fisher suffer uh, activities, economic activity that rely on fishery is suffering. How we make decision that will not exacerbate those trends, but help to address what the local people are facing and how we can build further capacity of the people to be more resilient. You can see uh, some of the example I think that has happened if riverbank gardens no longer uh, be possible or very uh, uh, risky for the people to depend on, could we maybe uh, have some intervention that help Riverine community grow uh, vegetable in different way as the picture in in the last uh, on the right is showing. So those are I think some of the important um, intervention and capacity that different actor uh, need to uh, promote more uh, to ensure that community have more capacity to adapt. Because as I mentioned earlier, the risk is increased much faster than the ability of the people to adapt. Thanks, Achita. I mean, to me, you're a very good integrator. You know, I mean, there's the, uh, I mean, as, as Sachita speaks about Tonley Sap, I know that Mr. Sopper, and I won't ask you to comment now, but, you know, recent MRC work backs up, you know, that whole change in the flood pulse at Tonley Sap. You know, this is not speculation or one year. This is a, a, a changing system. Um, Dr. Sutat is, you know, providing another piece of the puzzle, but I think Sochita has sort of mentioned a few of the other signals, you know, that are just as relevant, that the seamstress can't work or, you know, um, are, but are the positive signals perhaps that this uh, lady who I've never met, uh, Duong, you know, is also then moving forward. And I don't know how that opportunity is created, but I hope there's thousands of opportunities like it. Um, what uh, Sochita did mention about, oh, we just uh, uh, met previously, is that uh, along with other sort of First Nations and Indigenous um, uh, representatives from around the world, they basically made, and Sang is here in the room, made a very big impact at the, the World Water Week, both last year and this year, the home of um, Stockholm Environment Institute. But it was a very interesting um, influence on what is traditionally a very techy uh, sort of forum. So um, well done on that. Um, Ajahn Surachai mentioned, Sochita, that a uh, bit of a challenge across the region for, um, in his uh, stronger words, a um, bit of democratic backsliding and whatever else. How hard, is it getting harder or easier for you in your role, a regional role um, with Oxfam to sort of have these high quality discussions and influence um, influence the way in which conversations are held in the Mekong countries without putting you on the spot to be too specific. Thank you. Uh, certainly, I, I was very interested in the uh, remark uh, of our speakers this morning and uh, couldn't agree more that uh, space for operate in the region have shifting um, I would not say close or open, like it is shifting. So as someone working in this space, I think we need to be able to adapt 
and how we we will not be we will not uh, be making a conclusive point because it is open and closed or shifting is based on our relationship and how we uh, conduct the discussion. So, for example, I think uh, in the region, my country included, we just have a new government and there are various perspectives about how to engage with the new government. But I think that when we look at the strategic priority in the government, for example, in relation to, uh, you know, coping with climate change and the resilience, it has been um, put as the one of the pillar for the new government. So as uh, Oxfam or as civil society actor, how do we prepare to engage and build on uh, strategy, strategic priority that uh, government already put out? And definitely, I think from civil society actor, from researcher, from science, we have different angles that we want to advance. So how do we uh, put our um, agenda that contribute uh, to those already in, in the plan of the government. Definitely, we need to focus on uh, priorities and the needs, but I would uh, strongly point out that uh, in this regard, uh, the important aspects of inclusion, of equity, especially for those who are most marginalized, the poor, the women, the people with disability, or indigenous people that have greatly suffered from uh, the current um, impact they put they should be and need to be front and center in the way in which we uh, frame the discussion in the way in which we develop the strategy or intervention or even build the capacity for them and their organization to be able to be more resilient in this because I think we have to me we have no other choice we have to live with it how we adapt and how we help the people to be more resilient in coping with their everyday um, please join me in thanking Suchita for her Mekong perspective. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're not going to go and sort of take up all the lunch time. And very sorry that we haven't had a 30-minute chat with the floor, but the time just doesn't allow for that. So I think that uh, just recalling, um, we have uh, heard uh, from uh, uh, Un giving us you know, quite the lower perspective, and we appreciate that very much. Dr. Sutat, Hydroinformatics, Jan Shu, um, a very, a very, um, uh, I don't know, wild? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure the, the right word, but you know, big picture of what could happen with, with agriculture. And so Cheeta, I think, has just reminded us of the, uh, uh, the need not just for climate adaptation but for political adaptation and I think that goes for anyone who calls themselves a scientist as well if we even look at their the title of the event you know what is it bridging science policy and practice that's fine but that to do that one needs to be thinking politically you know as to how to be um, most effective so I know that these four people sort of operate within their Mekong polities and are trying to be as effective as they can be. So thank you all for a good morning. Uh, I would ask us to put our hands together for our panel and then we'll go to lunch. Thank you so much to our panel. Before we set off to lunch, I have um, I invite you to look at um, our drawing for today, for this session, Mekong Perspectives. Um, you will see more of these um, towards the end of the day. I would like to... Niall? Okay. Okay. John, we're going to allow two burning questions. Yes? Two burning questions. Who would like to take the first one? No one? But we just allowed it. Okay, there is. Okay. The brave gentleman from the back, please. Do you have a mic? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a very quick uh, question. I'm Chandrat from the Cambodia Development Resource uh, Institute, CDRI, Cambodia. Um, Last week in Phnom Penh, um, 
my mom uh, looked into the sky and told me to take the clothes in. I said no, um, because according to my Google weather, the, my phone, it will rain at 4 p.m. But she said, take the clothes in now. <laughs> and then uh, it rained. So this, uh, I want to follow up with John's uh, comment on the, the heart, was it? With the nature and the heart attached to technologies and AI. Because uh, I see that this unity here be happened because my mom's heart is attached to the nature, but mine is attached to technologies, iPhone. Uh, <laughs> so, um, some speakers uh, spoke about the importance of local knowledge, right? And some uh, spoke about technologies, uh, science, data, technology, science, um, tools, and methods, etc. So, um, professor from China talk about uh, digitalized uh, agriculture. But I think uh, smart agriculture or digitalized agriculture is very expensive. In many countries in the Mekong region, uh, farmers still do farming in traditional ways. So my question to the panel is, what, what are better ways you know, to increase the, the, the unity between the attachment to the nature and attachment to technologies? How can we, you know, um, not we, uh, farmers and science, scientists and you know, technologies people uh, work together to increase the synergies of local knowledge and science and technologies, especially in agriculture, yeah, in, in the uncertain times of okay. climate change. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, anyone like to respond? Go. And anyone else with questions, just sort of make yourself uh, visible to one or other of the colleagues. Okay, I, I think a very, a very important come to a session called Mountain, uh, Mekong Perspective. What a Mekong Perspective, uh, perspective. We, we need a combination, integrated approach with the mother approach, really link with nature, with a uh, young generation linked to technology. We need both, you know. So mountain, uh, Mekong perspective will really uh, look at the traditional farming system, farmers living with risk, with happiness. So that's the philosophy. So if we believe we are resilient, we adapt, and then we adapt. I think uh, that's the first step, and then with technology will bring new dimension to coping with the new risk. So that's my quick comment. Anyone else there? I see Dr. Sutat and Un. Uh, yes, it's expensive. The, the cost of investment. Uh, second, you need to join the present technology and local uh, knowledge. We, we did it at HII and it fit quite well because we listen to the local community and take that variables into the design of water management. Uh, and the third one is that, yes, if it is young generation in the junior that we work with them, they jump into technology IoT directly. And then they just apply with the older people. So it depends on the, how you brand this. That's why it, it is no theory, it is the art how to mix up with, with these technology, local people, and all variables. Thank you. The only thing I would add is that um, my reaction is we're better as a team than as an individual. So you and your mother are probably a better combination than one of you on your own. Um, please, others that would like to uh, toss a question or a remark. I can always run over time. Right, we can we can we can roll as long as you like. Um, but uh, welcome any reactions or suggestions. And I see a hand up at the back, and I hope that lady Cynthia, I think it is, I hope she has a mic. And then Jin Sato, welcome by the way. While we're getting Cynthia a microphone, 
Um, can I just acknowledge Jin Sato, who I haven't seen for 20 years until today. <laughs> thank you so much, wonderful panel, and thanks to each and every one, um, and to the excellent moderation. I wanted to reflect on the fact that uh, people commented on the pessimism, the optimism. We've seen some ways forward. Arguably, a few short years ago, we had a lot more reasons for pessimism in relation to climate because we hadn't seen the ability of regions and of, uh, of the world globally to pivot and to change from individual behavior change to regional policy coordination to global policy coordination. The pandemic for everything it wrought on the world that was terrible, it also showed us that change is possible in a coordinated and rapid way from technology to social systems. But we don't, we don't talk about it now. So I wanted to ask the panel just very quickly, what is it that we can draw on the lessons or the, um, the adaptability of their coordination? What is it we can draw on and that we need to put into place now from the pandemic into climate response? Just hold your thought on that. And can we get the mic to Jin Sato, please? In the middle of the room. Okay, John, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jin Sato. I'm a, a professor at the um, University of Tokyo in Japan. Um, I haven't seen John for 20 years and um, I, I feel like we've been talking about the same, well, this is an interesting event to think about whether, uh, because we, back in the, 20 years ago, we were talking about participation, um, citizen science and all those things. So it's, it's a good thing for me to reflect on whether we, we've made any, any progress uh, in the past 20 years. One, I, I just want to share one thing. I, I came back from Ubon Rachatani for my field visit and I visited a, a flood affected area and people were measuring the depth of Mekong River with a bamboo stick. And they're doing it in, in, a, in a different location and, um, and they're connecting the information, the statistics by line among the villagers on a voluntary basis. And why do they have to do it? Because the government warning system is not functioning or at least it's not friendly to the villagers. So, it, 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 you, so it's not delivered in a, in a villager's understandable way. And so I was really impressed by the sort of the, the you know, the invention of, of, of the citizen science and the statistics that the, the villagers are putting together on a voluntary basis. But there needs to be a system. So it's not the lack of knowledge or science, but need, there needs to be a system to connect what the scientists produce and the government produce and what people are doing um, in, in a productive way. Uh, so it's, it's the mechanism of connection rather than producing more knowledge and, and that's something that I learned in Ubon Rajatani. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Jin. And the other thing that's happened in the last 20 years, of course, is the invention of line, which is um, a bit of a transformation in communication in Thailand. Um, so, Chida, um, in relation to Cynthia's question about the pandemic, do you, you know, what, what do you think we learned and what do you think could apply um, now as we're tackling this? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. I think that uh, if we can uh, draw um, key takeaway from the period of uh, COVID and lockdown, uh, for me is that uh, it is possible. And when we when we change or when the whole society change how we relate to nature and let the nature, you know, grow on its own, then it can replenish. And we can see that with the uh, mobility of the people not possible and we don't pollute through lots of flies and cars and so on that it actually make a change and then the earth system can uh, replenish itself so i think those are for me it's really key that there is always hope we need to change our behavior and our relation toward nature toward our environment to how we build a house or how we, whether we take a taxi from Suvarnabhu Airport here or take the red line together with other, those little action that we do is actually contributing to the change and contribute, not adding more, but slowing it down. I just want to maybe link to the last point. Uh, I think that uh, the bamboo stick used as a, 
a meter pole to measure the water is also the experience that we have in uh, provinces along the Mekong. Um, for us, I think that uh, systems of early warning uh, that may be introduced and already exist by the government uh, need some uh, some works to make it function and serve the purpose. But I think the important uh, point also is that how when we uh, make the intervention, we take into account local knowledge, indigenous people's knowledge about the ecosystem, about the, the river that they have been living with for many generations and combine those knowledge together. I think uh, from uh, our speaker earlier when he mentioned about um, how the information that is gathered is shared to the community in a way that community could understand. I think the most important point is we not only generate the information, but information need to be usable by the end user so that they can use that information to make an informed decision whether they have to evacuate or not, whether they have to plant crop or not. And this is important, but it's really difficult. So when we design how we create the platform that co-create and take not only scientific information, but also local knowledge to make the design that is people-centered and usable. Thank you, Sachita. I'll get to Dr. Sutat in a minute, but Un, how are people sort of, uh, you know, what are people using in the Namu to sort of uh, uh, measure change? And what's the, the added, you know, what would you like to see happen versus what is happening now? So, um, many of you would know Nam U, which is a basin running from northern Laos, flowing to uh, Mekong in Luang Prabang. And there are seven hydropower dams over there. So, the flow is no longer natural. Uh, it's uh, completely regulated. So, I think um, the communities downstream of those different infrastructure uh, now heavily rely on the notification coming from the facility, the hydropower facility, because they it's really unpredictable, uh, unlike the natural force. So that's what happening. And I think um, colleagues from Ministry of Energy and Mine is here. Um, they are doing pretty good job in terms of um, making the operators you know comply to what they need to do. I'd like to um, actually respond Just to... not too long though, please. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, no response. I, I actually want to question back to a number of scientists here. In terms of the lessons learned from the pandemic and how we adapt that into addressing the climate change. You know, when the pandemic happened, the whole world was so panicked with information, with media, right? The question I have to the scientists here is that, how do we strike balance between making the, the world panic? Do we want to, re to make the same level of like the pandemic happen? Or do we want to strike balance that this is an ongoing issues, long-term issues that uh, the, the global citizen needs to react to? I think that's a question back to your scientists. Thank you. It's a great question back. They will not answer now, but I did say, Dr. Sutat, um, what's your reaction to sort of the, the comment from uh, Professor, Professor Jin? Yes, uh, I think it should be the bottom-up approach. If you have successful story and successful example, people will replicate and duplicate themselves. This is the na na nature. So you, that's why you should expand before you scale up. But to scale up systematically, we, we are thinking of how to scale up uh, uh, community water resource management for two years. We, we try ma many things, but not successful. We, we keep thinking of how to scale up the successful story, the bottom-up approach to the top down, and where is the joy that link together. Okay, thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this time I really think I should stop or I'll be in trouble. But again, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists.